Welcome to the virtual forum on fossil fuel supply and climate policy. We have a one hour plenary session and then two one hour parallel sessions today. My name is Peter Erickson. I am co-chair of this forum along with my colleague Georgia Piggott. We, Georgia and I, are both senior scientists at the Stockholm Environment Institute. The reason we are holding this forum is the same reason that we have sponsored two academic conferences that precede it. The climate problem is by and large a fossil fuel problem. About three quarters of global greenhouse gas emissions are from fossil fuels. Most fossil fuels need to remain undeveloped if we are to hold warming to two or 1.5 degrees. And yet, as the production gap report has shown, the world's governments are currently planning on producing 50% more fossil fuels by 2030 than would be consistent with the two degree pathway and 120% more than would be consistent with a 1.5 degree pathway. This means that to address the climate crisis, it may be important not only to create policy around emissions and fossil fuel demand, but also about fossil fuel supply and the workers and communities that currently produce those fossil fuels. Good morning, everyone. I'm Georgia Piggott. Uh, as Pete mentioned, we're co-chairing this forum here today, and I'm really happy to have you all here. Um, I'm just going to speak briefly about the conference on which this forum is based. Some of the people on the call today have attended this conference, but I think we have a lot of newcomers as well. So I just wanted to explain a little bit about the conference. Um, we're holding this forum today in lieu of a two-day conference that would have been held in Oxford this year, but has obviously been disrupted by the COVID pandemic. Um, we hope to hold the conference again next year on September 27th to 28th in Oxford with an option for remote participation for those of you who might want to join remotely and not travel. Uh, we're gonna post a link in the chat box now to the conference website that uh, you'll all be able to go and see. Uh, I invite you all to sign up there for updates. That's how we'll be communicating when we open things like the call for paper, the call for presentations and remote sessions. Uh, but it's never too early to start thinking and we hope today forum will spark some ideas for conference presentations or panels that you might want to host next, next year. We'll be opening the call up in February for that. Um, on the conference website you'll also find some archives of the previous two conferences and two journal special issues that came out of these conferences which we'll put in the chat box now for you, those of you who are interested. And of course, these sorts of efforts, big conferences like these, take a team of people. It's not just Pete and I. Uh, We'd like to thank, we have a range of uh, steering committee members, institutional partners, and sponsors who have helped make this event and our previous conferences happen. We're just gonna, rather than list them all off because we're lucky to have so many of them, we, I'll just plug a li uh, link in the chat box for you to check out who those are. And so with you all fully informed about the conference, I'll hand back over to Pete to let you know what the plan of action is for today. Thank you, Georgia. <laughs> So this plenary, this first hour is on fossil fuel production, COVID recovery, and just transitions. We have five panelists and an esteemed moderator from the United, La United Nations lined up. We then have two breakout sessions. One is on prospects for international cooperation to manage a transition away from fossil fuel production. The other in Spanish is the implications of the crash crash in fossil fuel markets for fossil fuel producers in Latin America. A warning sign for what is to come. And again, that one is in Spanish. There are separate Zoom links for each of those breakout sessions. We'll be posting the links for joining those in the chat at the end of this session. Please be aware that these sessions are being recorded. We'll be posting the recordings to the conference website later this week so you can watch any sessions that you missed. Throughout the forum, please use the question and answer, that is the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask questions or to comment on other people's questions. Please do not use the chat function. We will not be monitoring that. So with that, I'd like to introduce Anne-Sophie Sarasola, who will be our moderator. Dr. Sarasola is director of the Climate Ambition Team in the Executive Office of the United Nations Secretary General. And Sophie, the floor is now yours. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. And, and I thank you again for this uh, kind invitation. And to be honest, I'm very keen to listening to our panelists, uh, and uh, which in their distinguished capacity, I'm sure will help us a lot. Um, as you know, uh, I think we all made uh, the same diagnosis. Recovery plans uh, against COVID uh, have to address the terrible consequences of the crisis, but they are also in a way, even though it feels terrible to say that now, but they are also a remarkable opportunity to make some structural changes uh, in the transformation toward the low carbon resilient economies that leave no one behind, which is something that countries agreed uh, to create when they signed the Paris Agreement in 2015. As you might have heard, the Secretary General has repeatedly emphasized the need to underpin recovery plans with what he called six actions that would be positive for climate and for people. One, invest in green and decent jobs. Two, do not bail out polluting industries. Three, end fossil fuel subsidies. Four, take climate risk into account in all financial and policy decisions. Five, work together. We are the United Nations. And six, most importantly, leave no one behind. Uh, and in fact, the Secretary General has flagged many times that taxpayers' money and public funds to be spent on the recovery should deliver green and decent jobs through a sustainable transition. And most importantly, he has insisted over and over that polluters must start paying for their pollution. In fact, he's been saying that he doesn't see why his own tax money should be spent on pollution. You must have seen also that the Secretary General is extremely concerned about coal phase out and energy transition. This is because, like you have, although we have seen a positive global trend of decreasing use of coal for electric produc electricity production, and we will hear more on that, the phase out is not happening fast enough. And in some countries, we are even seeing significant pipelines of coal power plants being approved and built, which means that they will be emitting GHGs for the next 50 to 60 years. Our climate cannot handle this. People's lungs and overall health cannot handle this. And economies will suffer with the stranded assets being created when renewable energy is cheaper year by year. And major consumer preferences are evolving quickly. We have also noticed, uh, as you have, I'm sure, that the financial sector is opening its eyes to this too. And that more and more fossil fuel projects are becoming impossible to fund due to lack of financing and increasing concerns from investors over climate risk looming over their portfolios. It's still worrying to see some governments uh, that are using their taxpayers' money to finance these own economic projects in other countries. This is why we need countries to unite and help each other enter the future and quicker. And moving toward key G20 meetings and COP26 next year, we need to gather momentum and show progress in energy transition from more financial entities, more governments, and more subnational jurisdiction. We at the UN, we hope that countries that are facing a critical junction between continuing traditional and polluting energy generation and expanding renewable energy and other technologies of the future, there are several countries in this position, Japan, Korea, Indonesia, Vietnam, Colombia, South mm -hmm. Africa, Poland. Many partners in this call, including our team at the UN, are ready to support them by any way we can uh, to help them make the transition toward renewable energy. So I hope that we will hear more on, on policy supports and on solutions uh, in this panel. Um, and we will now start uh, the uh, discussion. Uh, and if I have understood well, uh, Peter, I will now ask uh, Fatima Denton to uh, speak and to make her first presentation. Fatima, you have the floor. Thank you.
Fatima, I think you're unmuted. A classic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne Sophie. And, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Um, let me sort of um, preface my commentary um, and just talk very quickly about COVID 19 um, and some of the, the realities on the ground that we are seeing. Um, just in the way of observations, I'd say, first of all, that um, COVID-19 has actually forced us um, to ask more pointedly, I would say, what is the future of hydrocarbon resources and what role will it play in terms of our growth and economic um, transformation plan? So that's one. Um, I think there is no longer any doubt that we have to make the transition. I think the question now is about how fast we can get there, you know, um, but I think it's clear that a green transition is necessary. I think it's also clear that fossil fuels can no longer be the fuel of choice. Um, certainly, um, we have to think about it in terms of how we decouple our economic growth from fossil fuel. And it's a radical paradigm shift. It means that in Africa, we have to start thinking that fossil fuel cannot possibly boost our in industrial processes. The fossil fuel cannot drive our economies. The fossil fuel can, we, that we have to, let me put it differently, that we have to reproduce a new model of growth that is different from mature economies and a model of growth that is not dependent on fossil fuel. So that's the challenge for Africa. Now, let me put it in a more categorical manner to say that if the world needs to get to the Paris Agreement and to a 1.5 um, degree sort of warming, Africa has to become the world's conscience. Because if you look at the population of Africa today, and if you add another 1 billion in terms of where it might get to in 2050, if Africa uses all of its potential in terms of oil and gas, then we're going to be in a very big uh, mess, bigger than the one we find ourselves in. So Africa will have to be part of the global solidarity um, um, transition, um, has to be part of that pathway um, in terms of how we get to our ultimate goal. Um, now, looking at it in terms of COVID-19 and some of the problems we've seen, first, there has been a big revenue loss. Um, the pandemic uh, obviously has impacted on countries differently because African countries are not all the same. The hydrocarbon rich country um, are obviously going to be hugely affected because many of them depend on oil and gas revenue. Um, so. This is the case because many of these countries, if you take Angola, if you take Nigeria, um, Libya, these are countries that are price takers. Um, because they're price takers, they're also risk takers. They do not have much in the way of influence in terms of shaping the oil prices or even making the big decisions, maybe with some except, exception, Nigeria and to some extent, um, Libya. Um, but they are exposed because they are commodity driven economies. They are exposed to all of these exogenous shocks and that is a major problem. So I would say that COVID-19 has actually fast forwarded the reality that African economies have to be more diversified and that tremendous dependency on oil and gas is not the way forward. Secondly, very quickly, is the fact that even when African countries wanted to take advantage of the cheap oil, it wasn't possible because of the fact that they do not have the relevant infrastructure. Um, they do not have storage capacity. They do not have refinery um, um, sort of capacity and therefore could not take advantage of this. Um, and that is also to say that they must look at oil and gas differently. This is perhaps the only region in the world where we do not have a geostrategic vision related to oil and gas. We produce, but we don't add value. Um, and this is a problem because it means that we are going to be tremendously um, exposed um, to loss, but also to capital flight. Um, and we, we know that that is happening um, and it's happening at a rate that is faster than what we can actually um, bring in in terms of oil proceeds. 
Um, the, 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 the break in the value chain also, I think, was one evident um, sort of observation that we saw, because as I mentioned, we are producing, but you know, we're not adding value. Um, so the, the value chain was broken. Um, and this, uh, as I said, is, is a major problem. Um, we've also seen that many African countries are going to have difficulties in terms of managing their fiscal spaces, um, because with the economic fallout, um, the fact that most uh, oil prices went below to almost zero, um, that this actually affected um, the space that countries have. And this is important because there are countries that are using oil proceeds in terms of social spending. Ghana, for instance, uses some of these proceeds towards, um, 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 what's the word, towards um, spending on education, senior high school. Um, in countries like Angola, um, proceeds are used also towards health and towards education. Um, so when a country like Ghana loses about 40% of its revenue in terms of oil revenue, it will have impact on its ability to implement the sustainable development goals. Um, and all the goals are crucial, but education is even more crucial. Um, other goals are also equally important. But for countries in Africa, this is, this is something that we have to take into account. So I think um, we also find that we are going to be in a situation, and I'll, I'll just say this and stop there, um, of stranded assets. Um, I think you mentioned this, Anne-Sophie, and it's a huge problem because Africa is no longer at that crossroad. This is a reality. And I think what COVID-19 did was made the reality even starker um, that stranded assets is going to be a real problem because the value of these resources are depreciating and because the world is going to turn its back on these resources. Um, and it's coming at a time when Africa need a you know, stable supply of energy for its industrialization, for its cities that are growing, um, for its economic growth, Africa does need energy. Um, and maybe the needs that it has may not all be, um, cannot all be secured through renewable energy. So it probably needs to have a dualized approach where it will probably work towards a managed exit. Um, natural gas is seen as a fuel of transition and this is not lost on many of Africa's leaders who see this as a sovereign right. Um, and these are some of the uncomfortable part of the discussion that we must have, that in some countries in Africa, it is hard to dissuade um, political leaders or leaders in short, that they cannot use the resources that they have now um, because of um, their, their need to, to work towards climate action. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop here um, for now, and Sophie, because there's obviously quite a lot to say, but I know that there are other um, um, participants that are waiting to have the floor, but I'll stop here for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Fatima. And, and let me apologize to you and to our audience because I didn't properly introduce you. Uh, Fatima Denton is doctor, director sorry, of the UNU Institute for Natural Resources in Africa. And prior to joining UNU, Dr. Denton worked in Ethiopia with the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. And thank you, Fatima, I think you touched on, on, on many crucial points, in particular that oil revenue is revenue, and this revenue is used, of course, uh, to fund you know, social programs, and that we cannot skip you know, that easily, uh, that question, especially in a time of, a, of, of, of credit crunch. And, and this we need to be properly addressed. Of course, we come back to that. Let me now uh, turn to Dr. Iveta Jehazimchuk. Uh, Dr. Jehazimchuk leads uh, the Sustainable Energy Supplies Activities at the International Institute for Sustainable Development, as well as its Global Subsidies Initiative. Um, Iveta, you have the floor. Uh, many thanks uh, for the invitation and the introduction. Um, I'm going to speak on behalf of um, a group of organizations behind the energy policy tracker uh, and focus on where the government support is now going in response to the crisis. Uh, so it's a big group of organization, uh, organizations. Some of them are involved uh, into today's forum and uh, it's a privilege to uh, represent them all. Uh, my main point for today, and that's the next uh, slide, is that uh, the COVID crisis has been, of course, um, a test to 
uh, many systems. And unfortunately, uh, that also uh, was a test to our fossil fuel addiction and uh, most governments have tested positive. So uh, in terms of green recovery, unfortunately, there was a big failure on behalf of um, most governments according to our data. Uh, so with the next slide, I'm going to uh, focus on the G20 countries, but uh, at the high level, the COVID crisis has intensified the trends that existed before. So those governments who have traditionally uh, subsidized and supported fossil fuel production and consumption have thrown even more money um, at fossil fuels. And those countries that started the uh, clean energy transition tried to use also recovery uh, response measures um, to uh, green their systems. So for the G20 countries, you can see here the data from last week, we're updating it every week uh, on Wednesday. So for the G20 countries, uh, over 200 billion uh, went to uh, fossil fuel consumption and production and only around 136 um, billion went to uh, clean energy. Uh, so I have to say that this is, of course, um, data uh, uh, that we have been able to collect for main sectors of energy production and consumption. Uh, and this is mainly the sectors of mobility. Three-fourths of the uh, support you can see here is for mobility, airlines, airports, uh, highways, um, car manufacturers. Uh, and then we also have uh, looked at uh, resources at the extraction sector, at power generation, and at buildings. Uh, so in speaking um, of the trends, I think uh, the evident uh, thing here is that uh, responses have been rushed and most governments that don't, didn't have a plan um, or a blueprint um, for genuine clean energy transition uh, have been at a disadvantage in this terms uh, for green recovery. Uh, there are some notable exceptions. There are some emerging kind of good practices. Uh, for instance, uh, the European Green Deal. There are good ideas in New Zealand in terms of recovery, um, in Germany, in France, to a certain extent in South Korea. Uh, but most governments didn't have um, this blueprint, and as I said, unfortunately, for this reason, they have uh, failed um, this um, test. Uh, we are expanding now our database, we're adding more countries, um, we're going to add public finance uh, to the database as well. Uh, and we do have hopes for greener recovery, uh, but this balance at the moment is very, very fragile. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Iveta. And I very much keep uh, what you just said now that we need a plan. Governments need a plan uh, really to move forward because this is so complex uh, to organize uh, the transition that, that they need to see the way forward. And this is, of course, something that all of us work on uh, one way or um, another. Let me uh, now introduce uh, Speaking of plans, uh, Christoph McGlade, Dr. McGlade is a senior analyst with the International Energy Agency, where he works on the World Energy Outlook. He recently co-led uh, the World Energy Outlook special report on sustainable recovery. So speaking of trends and plans, uh, Christoph, tell us what you have uh, found. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne-Sophie, and thank you to all of the organizers for the opportunity to speak to you. So just, I think, to uh, premise my remarks, I think it would be useful just to give a little as to what has happened so far because of the pandemic. So um, obviously it's, it's been a huge economic shock for the world as a whole and it's impacted all uh, employment and investment across different sectors. The energy sector in particular has been very uh, badly affected. There's around about six million jobs that we believe or we estimate have either been lost or are at risk of being lost in the energy sector globally. In total, energy investment um, globally is down by around about 400 billion. 
that's around about a 20% reduction globally. And all different parts of the world and all of the different parts of the energy system have been affected. But major producers of oil and gas have, been, have seen the largest falls overall. Clean energy investment in renewables, efficiency in, in power grids and so on and so forth, they've, they've been slightly more resilient. And we estimate that around about 35% of investment in the energy sector now is into clean energy technologies. And this is its highest ever share and will be its highest ever share in 2020. But at the same time, this is far from sufficient and is far from what we need uh, to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement and the other sustainable development goals that exist. So in absolute terms, for example, investment in efficiency, in, 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 uh, in renewables in particular, more or less needs to double from current levels uh, between now and the late 2020s in order to meet all of these, uh, these uh, climate and sustainability goals. So how governments respond to the crisis is, is really going to be crucial. Um, and decisions that they make now are really going to reverberate throughout the energy system and throughout emissions levels for decades to come. And it was with this in mind that um, we at the IEA um, put together what we call the Sustainable Recovery Plan, for actions that governments can take now in order to, to boost the recovery from, um, from the pandemic um, and also to put us onto a more sustainable pathways going forward. So the overall objective of this, of this plan was to mobilize around about $3 trillion of new money um, to be spent over the next three years. So $1 trillion to be spent in 2021, 2022, and 2023. And um, as we have heard, there are some signs that some countries are, are, are taking this seriously. They're looking to make the best of a bad situation in terms of how they recover from the pandemic. But I think we should, we should um, take as a bit of a warning what happened after the previous um, uh, crisis. So after 2008, 2009 financial crisis, there was a, a slight dip in greenhouse gas emissions. But in 2010, we saw the largest ever pickup in CO2 emissions. Um, following, the, following the recovery. The recovery in that case was unfortunately not a green recovery. So while we expect CO2 emissions to fall by around about two and a half billion tonnes in 2020, um, from this recovery there's really uncertainty over how emissions are, are going to go fr from this point on. If the governments don't enact uh, plans as, as uh, laid out in the Sustainable Recovery Plan, it's very likely that emissions are going to um, peak um, are going to pick up again and uh, surpass that, that uh, level in 2019 ver um, very soon. However, we estimated that if all of the world's governments were to implement the Sustainable Recovery Plan, this would mean that emissions would be around about four and a half billion tonnes lower than it would have been otherwise by the end of the Sustainable Recovery Plan. And not only that, but it also kickstarts a new wave of clean energy investment. So it's not just about the spending in the next three years, but if they use this as an opportunity to really change investment patterns, and change, change their uh, energy priorities, we could really start to see emissions being put onto the necessary downward path and therefore see a reduction in emissions and also in, in fossil fuel consumption. I'll finish there, thank you very much. And thank you, thank you so much, Christopher, and also for reminding us that, you know, uh, lots of jobs uh, have been lost and it's not the transition from the old jobs to the new jobs, it's not that uh, easily done. And I suspect that uh, Mustafa will, uh, We'll uh, speak to this issue later. Um, let me now turn to uh, Dr. Tatiana Mitrova. Dr. Mitrova directs the Sokolkovo Energy Center at the Moscow School of Management. She has over 20 years of experience in analyzing Russian and global energy markets, including production, transportation, demand, energy policy, etc. We are very keen to uh, hear uh, Tatiana on the particular challenges of a country like, like Russia. Uh, over to you, Tatiana. Thank you, Anne Sophie. Thank you for the introduction and good afternoon to everybody. So, uh, indeed, many things were said already about the challenges uh, which are really facing this uh, green transition in the post COVID world. And uh, definitely, there are very contradictory messages coming from the different countries. So, basically, it's only the European Union which is stating very clearly uh, that it is moving uh, with the green core. Uh, but as for the rest of the world, uh, actually there is no consistency and I think uh, Yvette has shown it very well uh, during her presentation. 
but uh, for the uh, producers of the fossil fuels, these misleading messages are really creating uh, additional uncertainty because on top of all the disasters they are facing right, right now with this dramatic drop in their revenues, which is uh, quite uh, understandable uh, with the demand uh, collapsing and uh, prices going down very, very sharply. Uh, but they also do not actually understand what will be the post-COVID recovery looking like and what will happen with the fossil fuels demand. And therefore, as usual, any system has its own inertia. They prefer to think that, okay, God will, will bless us and somehow the demand will come back to the pre-COVID levels. Uh, so if there is no clear message from the consumers, producers prefer to think that the status quo will be restored. Yeah, it, it might be a wishful thinking, it might be a mistake, but this is how the psychology of the decision makers work uh, around the world in all uh, resource rich countries. And uh, indeed, they are facing these problems with stranded assets, but probably the biggest problem is uh, this uh, decline in budget revenues, which they have no idea how to replace. So they, they need to find some other options. What are the alternatives? If it is not coal, oil and natural gas, then what could drive their economies and protect their stability? So basically, I can see only three things which could help them to make these strategic decisions which will actually define their economic systems for the next 30, 50 years, I don't know. Uh, and Russia indeed is a very good example because so far all the packages are only to support the biggest state controlled oil and gas companies. So it's very clear. But what could be done theoretically? Two carrots and one stick. Uh, carrots are capital allocation mechanisms for renewables, uh, really to support new technologies and uh, uh, to support uh, new energy. Uh, we need access for, to cheap capital or maybe for some countries even free capital. Uh, second, uh, second carrot is uh, access to the technologies they should be really available and technological transfer should be made much more easy and fast than it is. And one stick, oh, which is uh, at the moment the only thing that has really forced Russian government to start thinking about carbon regulation, is this announcement from the European side on their thoughts about carbon border tax mechanisms. It is painful, it causes a lot of resistance and irritation, but it works. So clear messages from the consumer countries on the new rules of the game that they are going to establish are really crucial for the producing countries to make their decisions. I'll stop on that, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Tatiana. That's quite a challenge that uh, you have led in front of us and we will come back uh, to what you said in particular on capital allocation and, and the question of access to technology. And I might even, you know, be a little provocative and ask everyone to think for a little of what kind of technology could be considered as a global public good, for example, the kind of technology that would allow access to renewable energy? Can we see that as, as a global public good, the way, for example, a, a COVID maxi, vaccine could be? Just again, uh, asking the question, maybe we want to come back to that. Uh, I'm going to now turn to our uh, last, uh, but not least, panelist, uh, Dr. Mustafa Kemalgev who is coordinator of the Green Jobs Program at the International Labour Organization in Geneva, and who was working before at UNEP, where he served as acting head on Green Economy Advisory Services. And of course, um, we are all very keen to hear Mustafa on how do we make the job transition, uh, which is going to be central, of course. Mustafa, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much, and Sophie and, and colleagues. Uh, um, uh, Christophe has mentioned the tremendous impacts that the COVID-19 pandemic had on the world of work. 
um, you know, this has been devastating. And, and because of that, the way the I will try to respond to the crisis, working with our constituents, uh, has been to work on a policy framework with four pillars. Uh, the first element was in the context of this crisis to, to stimulate the economy and, and employment because the crisis had boss impacts, negative impacts on boss demand and supply sites of the labor market. Then second, how to support enterprises, jobs, and income. You know, those are lost employment opportunities and enterprises that went um, uh, scaling down, how to keep business continuity. And the third element was to protect workers in the workplace because some could not afford to stay at home and this is also what we have seen in the fossil fuel industry, despite all the, the, the collapse in prices, people had to go to work to earn a living. And finally, uh, relying on social dialogue to find solutions. So I wanted to just focus my, my, my point on, on social dialogue, because we think that in the context of this uh, a crisis of this nature, building strong consensus among government, workers and employees organization on the process of managing the crisis in the first place and recovering from the crisis is, is fundamental. And here we, we're really talking of, of social dialogue, which you know, in the ILO we, we understand as all types of negotiations, consultations, or, or just a change of information between or among government, workers, and employees organization on issues of common interest. So I think that there are, this is critical to build the consensus that is needed for a crisis of this nature. But then I would like to emphasize three dimensions of, of social dialogue that I think uh, are essential. And we have seen that happen in a number of countries. And we have found also in the Iowa that countries that use social dialogue effectively have been able to manage the crisis better than others. So the first one is how to, use social dialogue in addressing the crisis, you know, finding ways to respond, uh, addressing a health crisis, but taking into account its economic and social dimensions. The second is uh, uh, covering a broad spectrum of uh, ways to strengthen social dialogue, even in the context of this crisis, you know, with all the lockdown measures that we have seen in countries, supporting collective bargaining and labor relations the institutions that make labor relations work and the processes that make uh, labor relations work. Uh, second is a social dialogue on the social economic policies. And here's where you need government to agree together with employees and workers where money should be going in the economy. You know, if we had proper social dialogue in all uh, countries, it's not very sure that what we have seen, you know, that what Iveta was mentioning, all this money going to the fossil fuel industry would have happened uh, because there are others who see alternative pathways to recover. And finally, I want to, answer, to, to, to men just quickly mention the importance of social dialogue on conditions of work and employment. And this relates also to occupational safety and health. And we have seen this in the context of the fossil fuel industry. Some have identified as part of the, the mechanism of spread of the virus in, in oil and, and gas platforms. And, and it is, it's essential that workers are protected, that you know, a dialogue takes place between employers and workers to make sure that conditions of work are decent and that conditions of occupational safety and health are in place uh, in the context of of this crisis and the transition. So I will maybe just stop here and, and happy to expand further, not to consume more time that I was allocated. But the, this last point is quite important. I'll be very happy to talk a little more on the critical importance of occupational safety and health in these conditions, uh, this condition that we live in today. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mustafa, and I agree with you. Uh, it would be very important to go back uh, to this question and in general to the issue that you just addressed. It's true that we talked earlier about the need for governments to make plans and to make clear plans to present the transition. But as you uh, reminded us of, and we saw it happening in some countries as well, this cannot be a vertical decision. 
if you don't uh, take the people with you, if you don't create uh, this form of social engineering mechanism uh, to, uh, to consult uh, workers, uh, to consult different sectors of the population on what needs to be done, how it needs to be done, and what kind uh, of, of, of conditions can be put in place, including, as you said, the safety, health, uh, decent salaries, etc. None of this will work if this transition comes, you know, from the top and is in a way imposed. We have seen examples in history showing that uh, this really uh, cannot work. And I see um, in, in the question and answer box, you know, some a lot of question on that. Uh, someone, I think it's had Winkler that mentioned, and it's true that it's a good example that in South Africa, for example, a just transition uh, mechanism had been put in place before uh, COVID, and this is certainly something we at the UN, uh, with you, Mustafa, have been looking at closely to see how uh, this could uh, be used. South Africa, of course, having a huge uh, core uh, issue uh, uh, to address, uh, and this is certainly part of the discussion. Maybe I'll turn to uh, uh, back to Fatima and, and ask her, because Fatima, you gave very uh, precise and concrete examples on, on Ghana and Angola and how our revenue is being used um, uh, for education. Maybe uh, could you expand on, on these examples of, of social transition dialogues, you know, between governments and, and citizens? There is South Africa, but are there other examples that you think uh, would be uh, interesting uh, to, to discuss and, and to, to use in this, um, in this panel? Okay, um, um, thank you, Anne-Sophie. Well, um, I think the Ghana example is a very good one, um, whereby, as I said, um, the revenue of oil um, is being sort of funneled um, to support education, especially providing free senior high school um, education. So that's a very concrete example. But I think these examples are few and far between in Africa. Um, I think I did also make the point um, that the way in which oil um, and gas revenues have been used have not been very sort of um, strategic uh, and certainly haven't been very productive uh, because, you know, it's an enclave economy, whether we like it or not. Um, and I think it's been a sector that has really benefited a, a, a comprador elite, if you like. Um, and what we need to see is if Africa is going to continue to really harness its growth um, and maybe continue with, um, you know, um, fossil fuel production for some time, it would be good to see how the proceeds of these um, resources could be um, used in a way that would develop human capital, could be used in a way that would also support relevant technologies. Um, there is definitely a sense that this is a continent that could actually harness its expansion of renewable energies. Um, but obviously that expansion would also need some investment. Um, and this is also a continent that hasn't been able to grow outside its natural resources. You know, there are countries that have done it, uh, but the majority of countries are very much reliant and very much dependent on their natural resource base. Um, so we do need to find a way of rebasing our economies, um, but the, the, the example that I gave, the Ghana example, is a very concrete one. I think um, Angola is also another concrete example where revenues of oil and gas are being um, funneled into specific growth areas related to health and education sector. But we need more examples of these. These examples are very few across Africa. Uh, thank you, Fatima. Yes, indeed, uh, they are. And maybe now I'll, I will turn back to um, to you, Tatiana, because what you've said, in particular on capital allocation, has raised a lot of interest, of course. And this is one of the discussions taking place globally. Um, maybe you've seen that the Secretary General, along uh, with Canada and Jamaica, has launched an initiative uh, on financing for development, looking specifically 
a debt uh, relief or consolation for some countries to again uh, give them some breathing air to reinvest uh, in, in the sustainable sector uh, of the economy. There's another global conversation and this is something that you talked about, about shifting subsidies, you know, uh, and, and this is, you know, technically complicated. It has to be also socially accepted this is what why uh, Mustafa mentioned was so important. So maybe could you give us a little more detail of maybe what's happening in, in Russia? Where is the conversation, the public uh, policy discussion in Russia or in other countries like Russia on, on the reallocation of, of, of subsidies and, and, and the, the capital reallocation uh, specifically? Well, thank you for the question. I'm afraid that the public discussion in Russia actually doesn't cover this topic at all, because for the establishment, it is still only focus on uh, fossil fuels uh, investments and uh, all the uh, financial system is designed specially to support them. There is one single mechanism uh, of uh, uh, special support uh, for the uh, solar and wind projects, uh, which uh, provides them guaranteed uh, return on investment. Uh, it works until 2024, but then it will expire and that's it. Uh, they are not actually now uh, speaking about any prolongation uh, of this whole uh, project. And uh, it is really a big pain uh, for the whole um, green uh, energy, uh, not only renewables, but also energy efficiency, hydrogen, or electricity storage, electric vehicles, or whatever we are talking about, because uh, in such countries like Russia, cost of capital is really very high. So borrowing, uh, you cannot find money cheaper than 10-15%. Uh, yeah, which is really very high uh, uh, cost and um, therefore providing any reduction in this cost of borrowing that already makes these new sources much more attractive. And if you add to that also a bit different uh, structure of CAPEX and OPEX, in renewables and in the fossil fuels. Yeah, with renewables, you have high CAPEX and rather low OPEX. So you are investing first and then actually doesn't require that much money uh, to keep uh, those installations working. So the cost of capital is really critical to make the first step. And therefore, uh, finding some ways through the state guarantees, through the international guarantees or whatever, which reduce this cost of capital, they will make really investments in the green energy more attractive from the economic point of view, not just because of regulation. And that could really switch the interest uh, of the investors. Thank you, uh, Tatiana, and I agree with you. This is also definitely a discussion that started a little, for example, in the, the G20. I know that it's currently Saudi Arabia leading the discussion, which, which is also, you know, which is extremely complex. And this is something that I believe the Italian incoming uh, presidency of G20 next year want to discuss exactly what you mentioned, the, 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 the cost of capital. Uh, basically. I would like us now to come back, uh, maybe uh, we have very 10 minutes left, uh, with Iveta, Mustafa and Christophe on what we uh, discussed earlier, which is the need to make plans. And some of you mentioned uh, South Korea, mentioned the European Union and other countries that are presenting uh, green sustainable recovery plans. Uh, of course, as you know, countries also have to prepare their climate plans and long-term <coughs> strategies for the uh, climate change COP, COP26 next year uh, in Glasgow. These countries are expected to uh, present more ambitious uh, nationally determined contributions with higher targets in terms of emission cuts, but also uh, they can include in these plans, and Mustafa maybe can address that question, also mechanisms to ensure that uh, there is a just transition and a social dialogue uh, in place to make sure that uh, these plans are properly um, implemented. Uh, so Iveta, very, maybe uh, very quickly tell us where we are in terms of, of, of preparing, making these plans and the connections between recovery plans and these NDCs, if you uh, see them already, what should be done to encourage them? 
Uh, Mustafa maybe could come in after to, to, to discuss how uh, these mechanisms of social uh, this debate and, and just transitions can be uh, also part of these plans and maybe Christophe also on, 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 on investments, you know, um, uh, being also um, uh, allocated to these plans. Iveta. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I'm afraid that uh, the connection hasn't been really made. I mean, it's uh, something that is discussed in the climate community. Uh, but um, as you may know, political and environment ministries are always um, uh, weaker, much weaker than finance ministries or economic development ministries. And that's the agency that work on recovery. Um, I can just give an example. So um, there was a clean energy, uh, green recovery ministerial uh, in Japan, uh, hosted by, the, by Japan uh, on the 3rd of September. And you can see um, uh, the submissions of countries on linking green recovery and climate goals. And uh, by submissions, unfortunately, you can see that some countries didn't even understand the question. So I'm very sorry to end on this note, but this is for all of us to continue working and also talking not to uh, the usual suspects and at wonderful conferences like this, but to a much broader audience. Thank you. Uh, don't be sorry. You know, we are here to, 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 to address reality, you know, as it is and not as we wish reality to be. Uh, otherwise, we, we will fail. Um, Mustafa, would you like um, maybe uh, give us a glimmer of hope or also tell us where we are on the climate plans and, and uh, just transition discussions, if any? Well, thank you. I, I think um, there is a positive news, at least, as you know, in the, in the last uh, uh, climate action summit that the UN Secretary General convened, uh, the Secretary General included in the debate not only the typical climate agenda of mitigation, adaptation, technology, etc., but he added a, a component on social and political drivers. Because there is this realization that we need social and political drivers to achieve climate ambition. And this includes the imperative of just transition strategies. If we're not able to manage well the labor market transition, the social consequences of climate action, the world is likely to face very powerful forces of resistance. So therefore, the, the good news is that at the last climate summit, uh, countries were, were invited to put forward what is called just transition plans, which means that they have a social plan alongside their objective to raise climate ambition. And we had 46 countries that committed to put forward those plans, you know, major economies, but developing countries. And I have even a, another good news, which is just last week, Nigeria uh, joined this coalition, made a formal pledge to develop a just transition plan, which takes us to 47 countries. Now we're working with those countries from Samoa we have set up an international board to guide this initiative with the Minister of Development Planning of Indonesia, Minister Ribera of Spain, the Minister of Labor of, of uh, Costa Rica, of Ghana. So we have a pool of ministers of environment, labor, and economic planning that we hope together can drive forward this agenda and helping countries put in place those plans for a just transition and implement them. Thank you, Mustafa. This is indeed uh, good news, and this is something that, that all of us have to look uh, closely at and encourage and really make sure that it remains at the core of, of these climate plans, as you said, and it's not just considered as some kind of a sad uh, activity that must be done, you know. It is indeed uh, central, and it must be uh, in the discussion. Um, Christoph, uh, on your side, maybe to, to uh, finish by, by looking at, for example, what Tatiana mentioned on, on uh, allocation of capitals and uh, of capital, sorry, and cost of capital. What are the trends that you've been uh, seeing? You mentioned a few of them in your initial presentation, but maybe you could expand uh, a little on that. Certainly, thank you. And perhaps just before getting onto that, I think one thing for us all to be aware of when we're having these discussions is that it is unfortunately the case that in a number of countries around the world, climate change and reducing emissions is not the number one priority. 
Um, and they, they, they have other priorities. It, it could be energy access, it could be air pollution, and in particularly right now, it could be um, jobs, unemployment, and also um, how to stimulate the economy. And, and it's very much with, with this in mind that we developed the, the sustainable recovery plan that we put together, because what we wanted to show was that you don't need to have a trade-off between a lot of these different things. You don't need to trade off creation of jobs with reducing emissions. You can do both. You can also stimulate the economy. You can also um, um, improve energy access, for example, while also helping to reduce emissions, and similarly also for helping to reduce air pollution. So one of the key things that we wanted people to, to take away from our sustainable recovery plan and the investments that are embedded within that is that there is no trade-off between all of these different objectives. You can, you can achieve all um, collectively with this, if you aim to maximize the synergies between them. And perhaps just to finish um, briefly on your, on, your, uh, on your point in terms of cost of capital, because again, I think this is one of the, the areas for, for a bit of cause of, of optimism, because we have seen that the, the cost of capital for uh, renewable projects for solar is, is in many places much lower than uh, the cost of capital for the new fossil fuel projects, and that's really helping to improve their economics. So in many places now around the world, the cost of installing new renewable technologies is lower than installing new fossil fuel um, power plants, for example. And I don't think that message is, is fully appreciated by everybody. Um, there are other hurdles to overcome when thinking about um, deploying renewables and uh, de deploying fossil fuels. But from a co pure cost perspective, the, the massive cost reductions we've seen in renewables and in storage, for example, in recent years, is, is really driving us in the, in the right direction in terms of where we're seeing, starting to see some investment flows. Thank you, uh, Christophe. And, and to the point you, you made at the, at the beginning, I think it's very clear for all of us at the UN and elsewhere that, you know, what we are doing is not about uh, carbon. Uh, it's, it's about people's health, people's education, people's welfare. And even if in countries they don't use the term climate change necessarily, a lot of it actually, as you said, it's connected, you know, this is about, you know, making sure that your air is clean, making sure you have access to electricity, making sure that you have a proper education, that workers' rights are respected, uh, that, you know, women uh, can be in charge. And again, even if the term climate change is not used, this is also what it's about. And it is, in fact, uh, all connected. Uh, and I will finish uh, on that. Uh, I want to thank uh, all our panelists. I want to thank uh, the audience that asked questions. I was looking at them and tried to pick uh, some of them. And I'm sorry that we could not uh, properly respond to all the questions. But of course, the discussion is still ongoing. Um, Peter, maybe I will give you back the floor. I think you might have some housekeeping um, announcements to make. And thank you again, everyone. Indeed, thank you again, all panelists, to, and Sophie, to you as moderator and to all our attendees. You're now invited to join one of two parallel sessions. The links are in the chat box, as well as on the screen here. And please do remember to go to fossilfuelsandclimate.org to sign up on our mailing list for future events like this, especially the conference that we hope to have again in Oxford uh, next year. So thank you everyone and see you at the parallel sessions. Bye, thank you.